Hello and welcome back to yet another episode of No Free Lunch Economics for a Fallen World. Dr. Heyman, the last time I checked, you're an economist and not a politician, but this might be a question for a politician would answer differently than an economist. What is the optimal size of government? How does an economist well, think about that? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really important question. I've got a diagram that uh, is, is, I hope, would be helpful. Because what, what we have, and, and this is very important in most of our discussions about uh, where the, uh, what, what the size of government is, we always talk about, well, we, we want government to do this, or we don't think the government should do that. But we never get to the opportunity cost, and that's what mm. economics brings to the table to help us think about this. So let's think about the, the demand curve for government. Let's think about the supply curve for government and see where it goes. So we can think of the demand, we can have a cost benefit as kind of the price. We can think of that as the price. And we can think of the demand curve for government as being this marginal social benefit. And, and we get some sort of benefit from having these government services. And so the only thing I'm assuming about the, these, two, these two graphs is to assume that first, we apply the limited resources uh, that we're gonna use for government spending on the most urgent issue first. So for instance, we might think it's a really good thing that we don't allow Genghis Khan to run over America in Congress. So national defense might be a very urgent and very important thing. And so that would have a very high marginal social benefit. And because we're gonna use just a few of the resources of our country to do it, the, the opportunity cost in terms of lost production in the private sector is relatively small. But then we might expand government and we might say, well, we want government to do national parks because we like a good vacation. Mm -hmm. And that, that we think that's important, but it's not as important as avoiding Genghis Khan running over the country. So the value goes down, but now we're using more resources yet to fund the national parks. That, that re, those resources had an opportunity cost in terms of what they could do in the private sector, so it starts to get more expensive. And you can just keep going down this path. Every subsequent uh, you know, use of government become, comes to apply towards a less urgent need in the same way that your, your demand curve for anything else would be. And so the value gets lower and lower as you go on. And the cost goes up and up and up. The bigger government it becomes, the much higher the cost because those resources, again, have an opportunity cost in, in terms of what they could have been used for in the private sector. And, and so the more you do, you're, you're taking away larger and larger and more painful. We're getting closer to the bone, so to speak, mm. in terms of the private sector opportunity costs. And what that su suggests is there is some sort of output where there's a maximum. I'm not telling you, and that goes through the political process to mm. say what that optimal is. But from our chapter, we, we start to see how there's gonna be some cases, and we're gonna go through an example in, in a moment, which can show that actually it can be net, net, we can be operating in the net negative social benefit because of the way politics distor mm. distorts the incentives. And we actually have a larger government than you might, uh, might want uh, from a socially beneficial perspective. I, I think this, this graph is very helpful because it does at least illustrate very clearly to us that there is a cost to government and there is an optimal amount. And when we have our discussions about the optimal size of government, let's say that some politician is going to put in a proposal for a new spending program. The, the, what we almost never ask is, we sometimes ask, how are you going to pay for that? But what mm. we really should say is, what don't we want to do? To do that means mm. we're not going to do something mm. else. Mm -hmm. Almost always the, the public conversation is, well, we'll make somebody else pay for that. Probably somebody that's not looking like me, uh, you know, because we don't want to, we want to tax somebody else, somebody prob preferably very, very, very rich or something. Uh, but, but we never kind of ask the question, what would those resources have otherwise done? And mm -hmm. from an economic point of view, that's a very important question. So let me see if I can tie this back to you when you were talking about externalities. And you said the cost of an externality is maybe not knowable. We just don't really know, yeah. et cetera. Can we know QSTAR? No, we can't know. It's, it's going to be a subjectively uh, determined. Uh, but we can start to see, uh, when we start to see the presence of special interests that might not operate in the, uh, the public interest, you can see how this could go awry. I'm going to go ahead and jump forward with an example of this. I think sure. that's uh, probably okay. helpful here okay. to see how this can, where you can get, I just suggested, for instance, you could operate where there's a net negative mm. social uh, benefit. Let me illustrate how this would happen with something we call in public choice economics, uh, log rolling or pork barrel would work like this. 
we've got this in the textbook, but let me walk you through it. It's fairly complex, but when you see it, it's going to be pretty, pretty profound. So let's say that we have five congressional districts. And let's say that there are three projects being bid on. And every member of, a, of Congress wants the spending that would be in their mm -hmm. district. And so let's say there's a v, VA hospital that would be produced in District A. And this Congresswoman might get a $5 benefit from having that production. And let's say that there's a highway in, in District B her constituents are going to suffer costs. They're going to have to pay taxes, so it's minus two for them. And somebody else wants a space shuttle we put when we retired mm. in their district. That's minus two. And if, they, if Congresswoman A and Congressman B and C get together and agree to vote together, uh, uh, then they might all get this. And notice when you sum up Congresswoman A, her value to her constituents is a positive number. She's in favor. The same thing would happen for Congressman B for the highway, but he would pay the taxes on the VA hospital and the shuttle, but he's still positive. We see the same thing for Congressman uh, C, and, and that would lead to a positive gain. But now we need to come to those unfortunate poor souls, mm. Congresswoman D and Congressman E. They are a minority uh, party, and they, <clears throat> they therefore have no political clout. They are on the committee leadership, and they don't get anything in their district in this bill. Their constituents have to pay for each one of these. They lose uh, the money. They get, they get a total loss of minus $6. And so if you sum up the total benefits, we get a minus $9 overall as a uh, population for this, uh, these, these three things. But, but the reality is there's going to be three votes for and two mm, votes three, against. Yeah. This is going to pass. And we're going to have a, a, a massively negative social benefit in this particular case. Hmm. And, and I've got two titles up there. Log rolling is just vote trading. That's a way to think of that. And even if you outlaw the ability to officially vote trade, what they do is they put all these three bills in one bill. And we call that a pork barrel bill. And so there's something for everyone. There's enough for, to get it to pass. And once again, their, their minority uh, will, will get something uh, uh, We'll, we'll really, excuse me, we'll get nothing and they'll end up paying for it. And it may be the case that the minority in this case are the future taxpayers. And we'll talk about the national debt in another uh, mm. video. Yeah, I'm sure there's some interesting history behind why we call it log rolling and pork barrel, but that's probably for, for another, day. another day or for our listeners to look up themselves. So thank you for joining us for this episode of No Free Lunch Economics for a Fallen World.